Welcome back guys. In the last episode, I promised that it was gonna be nothing but parts, parts, parts around here for a little while. And this episode is going to live up to that promise. Now, as a reminder, we've got four fluid systems that we're working on at the back of the car at the moment. We've got the dry sump oil system, we've got the cooling system for the engine, the cooling system for the water to air intercooler, and the fuel system. Now, I'm waiting on a bunch of components so that I can get all of these systems fully fleshed out. Once we're there, we can plumb them. Now, after plumbing, we really only have to worry about the kind of wiring and electronics side of this build before we can get it fired up. Now, saying it that way makes it sound a lot closer than it is. We've got a lot of work to do before we're actually ready to run this engine, but I'm trying to keep the pedal down and make some serious progress. So I've been buying parts like crazy, and that means the FedEx guy has just dropped off a bunch of boxes. I've got no idea what's in any of them, so we're gonna get them on the workbench, get them opened up, see what we're working with, and see what we can get done today. Let's do it. So we've got a huge number of parts that we've got to get opened up and installed on the car. And while it's not included in this box, there's another package that showed up and it's a brand new microphone and pop filter set up for my voiceovers. So I'm hoping that my voice quality in this episode beats any video I've done before. You'll have to let me know in the comments. It should be a good improvement. Now, as you guys can see, there's a lot of parts here on the table and there's plenty more off screen. So deciding where to start solely comes down to which one I think is coolest. And that is the Clearview oil filter. Now this crazy looking thing is in many ways your standard oil filter relocation kit. It allows you to put the oil filter wherever you want in your plumbing system. It's got two inlet ports, one outlet port, and even one small port for a pressure gauge or in our case, a port for the turbo. Perhaps its most noticeable feature though is the polycarbonate window in the top of it. And you might be wondering what on earth is that for? Well, it's rather straightforward and simple. With this filter housing, you can actually see your oil flowing through it and you can see when particulates are caught. That's not really a necessity on a normal engine, but on one producing seriously high horsepower and under a lot of pressure, it can be hugely advantageous. All right, now admittedly, I'm probably a lot more excited about an oil filter housing than anybody probably should be. Plenty of you guys are saying, dude, who cares? What makes this thing that special? But I have seen the proof with my own eyes. My former business partner, Riley, put one of these on his Trans Am, and this thing revealed bearing material to the eye well before we thought that the bearings in that car were gonna need replacing. And it also caught pieces of a broken rocker while we were at the track and revealed that the engine was going to have a very bad time soon, very soon, if we hadn't been able to see the parts in the filter right away, simply checking it between sessions out on track. Now, if that doesn't make this thing worthwhile, I don't know what will. This thing can and will tell you of impending doom. It'll save your wallet, it'll save your motor. And I'm saying all of this as someone that just bought this at retail. This was not given to me, so take that for what you will. Now, obviously, or maybe not so obviously, this system still uses a traditional oil filter, and it's still not a bad idea to cut your filter open on occasion and see what's going on inside, but this really prevents the need to do that as often, or honestly, constantly. You can just peek into this thing at any point in time and see what's going on, or get a glimpse at least of what's going on inside of your engine. We need to get this thing mounted up, and it came with a nice billet bracket. I just need to find somewhere sturdy to mount it to. Building the bracket itself really isn't complicated, and I know you guys have seen it dozens of times at this point, but like my math teacher always said, I should probably show my work. So we're just gonna put together a very small, slim bracket that will mount to the chassis in the back of the car, something like this. This one came out a little bit bigger than it needs to be, so we'll slim it up and then get it cut out of metal. I tend to keep all of my scraps and cutoffs for situations just like this, where I need a small or slim bracket and some scrap steel will do the trick instead of having to cut something off of a fresh piece, and it tends to pay off. I don't know how I did it, but I uh, just went to go put my bracket on my mount and they don't line up at all. I really messed up somehow. <laughs> Let me redo that. So I repeated that whole process again, but I didn't waste my time filming it, and it came out a bit more accurately. So I got the bracket welded into the chassis where I know it will be nice and sturdy. Now I will say this was one heck of a position to be TIG welding in. It was a bit of a challenge, but it came out fine. Now the end result is obviously the most beautiful oil filter housing there's ever been. Now some of you guys might be wondering why I've chosen to mount it right here. Well, that answer has a few sides to it. The first is that I want to be able to see this thing while the engine's running if I'm standing behind the car, whether that's in the paddock or out front outside the shop. 
The second is that I needed to mount it somewhere where when I pull the oil filter off, I'm not going to be dripping and draining oil all over important parts of the car and making a big mess. There's some height here and I can get some material underneath it to keep a mess at its minimum. Last but not least, although it does seem out of the way, it's on the path to the oil cooler and that's where it goes with respect to plumbing. So it makes sense. All right, now with the oil filter mounted into place, we have most of the systems that we're gonna need in order to plumb our whole oil system here. We've got the pump down on the back side of the engine, and we've got our oil tank that we mounted in the last episode. Now, the pump itself has four ports on it. Three of those ports are gonna go directly to the tank here, but the last one, the pressure output, is going to come out of it and come around to our oil filter. It will come from our oil filter, down to one of our oil coolers, and then from that oil cooler, it will come back into the front side of the engine right down there. Now, that is a little bit of a long way to do this. I thought heavily about putting the oil filter right here on this side, because from a plumbing perspective, it makes a lot more sense. The lines would be contained to two sides of the engine with no crossovers. However, with all of the manifold heat right here and the exhaust coming out of this side of the turbo, that really just didn't sit well with me. It seems like we'd have a lot of trouble keeping the oil cool, and there's a higher chance of fire if we were to ever have a leak at the oil filter. So overall, I decided over here, a little bit longer in the plumbing department really isn't gonna hurt anything. It's just gonna add some overall fluid volume, and the pump's not gonna mind at all. So over here seems to make a lot of sense to me. Now on the note of plumbing, obviously we've got a lot of AN fittings. We've got some on the oil tank, We've got some for the fuel system coming out of the pump and for the return. We've got some for the cooling system. We've got some for the oil filter, for the oil cooler. I mean, this entire engine is plumbed with AN fittings. So we've got to sit down and draw some plumbing diagrams so we can accurately order all of the fittings that we're gonna need. And that can be kind of a challenging task. AN fittings are really expensive and it costs a lot of money to do this. My tactic is to really spend the time to try to figure out all of the fittings I'm gonna need ahead of time so I can order them in one fell swoop and not have to go back for more or wind up having to double order fittings in case I make mistakes. I mean, that's kind of how it goes sometimes, but with the cost of plumbing, it's smart to try to plan it all out ahead of time. So I'm gonna do that. The next new part that arrived is this Mishimoto coolant expansion tank for our engine because we need one. Now, this one's gonna work fine. I don't see myself changing it, but I do have a few complaints to make right out of the gate, and it's kind of unfortunate. This might be nitpicky, but the bolts that are in the top of this coolant bottle in order to hold the bracket on are tapped all the way through it, so they're technically not sealed. I can't imagine that it'll be a problem, but this system does rely on vacuum pressure to operate correctly. I may wind up having to put some sealant on the threads. We'll have to find out. Next on the list is the fact that the supplied hardware for the bracketry on it simply doesn't clear the bottle. I had to find my own button cap screws and even they hit the bottle when tightened down. And lastly, the holes for the supplied bracket on the top are not centered, so the bracket can only be mounted one way, which forces the orientation of the coolant bottle to be a specific way. And I could see that being problematic for guys who can't make their own brackets. But nevertheless, I got this thing mounted, and it does look good in the engine bay. It's tucked over in the corner, mounted using an L bracket that I fabricated to adapt it to a remaining mount still on the chassis from the original engine setup. Overall, I'm pretty happy, although you may wonder why did I mount it in this specific spot, which brings us to our next brand new part. This is a CSF 6x6x12 by by water to air intercooler core. And it's just that, just a core. So we're gonna have to build end tanks and a water inlet and outlet on this thing in order for it to actually become something usable. But if you aren't aware of what it is, the entire purpose of this is to cool our intake air, our charge air. In place of an air-to-air -air intercooler, we're going to be using coolant to actually cool the intake air temps. Cooler intake air temps means denser air, more oxygen, and more horsepower. The plan for mounting the intercooler is to put it in this cavity in the engine bay. I've been planning on this all along, and it's been what has necessitated some of the odd placement for some of these other components. Even still, it's going to be quite a tight fit, but I feel good about making it all work. Let me try to explain it. So forgive my crude example here, but the overall plan, once we get this thing mounted in this position, is to have an end tank that is shaped something like this, that comes off with an inlet on this side for the turbo, and then the inverse for the other side, shaped like so, 
with a bend that comes out and over to the throttle body and intake manifold. And then obviously we'll have water inlets and outlets on each end of our cooler. And overall, I think that this method should work pretty well. I like where the cooler is positioned. Uh, it should give us nice short charge piping, keeping lag down. Uh, I could mount it back here. There's a lot of room, but overall, I just can't come up with enough reasons to actually do that. So we're gonna stick with this, and I think the flow should be pretty nice. It is changing directions a little bit, but I feel pretty good about it. On the note of throttle bodies, another box that arrived over the weekend is our Bosch Motorsport throttle body that we're going to affix to our carbon plenum. This will require an electronic throttle body, but we'll cover that once we actually get there. We've also got some new TurboSmart goodies that also pair in part with our charge piping, the first of which is their 50 millimeter race port blow off valve. We'll get this stuck to the charge piping, but other than that, we've also got their fuel pressure regulator, which is relatively self-explanatory. And then there's this, their OPR T40, a oil pressure regulator for the turbo, which is pretty neat. It's gonna help us regulate the amount of oil entering the turbo from our high pressure oil pump and dry sump system. In the last episode, I showed you guys the K-tuned Mazir 20 gallon per minute water pump, but this is what we're gonna use to cool the engine. It's a much larger Mazir 50 gallon per minute water pump, and I think this is what we're gonna need in order to pump water all the way to the front of the car, cool it down, and then send it all the way to the back. We're gonna have some serious cooling demands on this car, but I have a pretty good feeling that we won't be suffering from flow issues while we're using this thing. The pump does include a nice simple steel mount that we can use to actually weld to the chassis. So we're going to get this pump and our other water pump installed when we actually pull the engine out to install our clutch and to paint the engine bay. Our last new part for this episode is this Anti-Gravity Batteries 51R battery sent over by BART as a contribution to the project. And I'm really excited about this thing. It is one absolutely mental battery. Now, I know a lot of you guys are wondering, Mike, how can a battery possibly be cool? I don't care, again, but it starts with the fact that I can do this on my pinky outstretched. This battery only weighs a few pounds. I'm standing here holding it. I mean, I'm shaking a little bit because it's still a handful of pounds on my pinky, but the fact that I can do that with a car battery is pretty impressive, and this thing packs a serious punch. It's got 1,200 cold cranking amps, it will definitely turn over anything we throw at it. I've used anti-gravity batteries in a few builds at this point. I used the tiniest little 16 cell battery to turn over the five liter Coyote with a blower attached to it in the Model A. So these things are incredible. This is a normal vehicle form factor versus like a small motorcycle or racing battery. But what's really cool is these newer anti-gravity batteries also have restart technology in them. It's got a key fob that will allow you to jumpstart your own battery if you run it down. Don't ask me how it works. I don't know, I'm not a scientist, but it's pretty sweet. We just gotta find a home for this thing because I have no idea where to put it. And on that note, guys, I'm gonna wrap this episode up here. I don't feel like getting out the camera set up, so you're getting a classic handheld outro. Hope you don't mind, but I hope you enjoyed the episode. We had lots of eye candy, lots of new parts. Got some stuff mounted. I've got my work cut out for me this weekend. I might try tackling getting the uh, charge air cooler end tanks done so that that can be kind of welded up and mounted. We've got a lot of plumbing to sort out. I gotta spend some time sitting down and figuring out everything that we're gonna need. I'll probably have to spend a whole day doing that and that's not too exciting, but all necessary steps towards getting done. We've still got some suspension fabrication. I gotta turn my attention towards the interior. And Amir over at RS Future called me today and said that our rear wing is done and our flat floor is done. So that just leaves a splitter and the diffuser. So I gotta make sure I have all of my ducks in a row so that we can mount the wing as soon as he brings it over. I'm pumped, there's a lot of stuff happening. Subscribe if you haven't, it helps me out and you don't wanna miss Tuesday's episode, we'll be back next week. I appreciate the support as always, I'll catch you then.